Today's video is about the deaths of Jose and Kitty Menendez. Jose Enrique Menendez and Mary Louise Menendez. And there's been a lot of talk in recent years about them, about the two boys or young men at the time, Eric and Lyle, brothers who actually killed them. And that's never been up for speculation. Well, actually it was for a few months after the murders, but, uh, but we're going to go into actually what physically happened during the, uh, during the case, when it actually happened, what physically happened to Mr. and Mrs. Menendez. And I've, I've got pretty strong uh, opinions about this. I'll get into that later, but I'm going to try to stick with the with with just what happened right now. This is something that was in our archives, is in our archives, and this is a check. It's dated on uh, October 26, 1984, signed by Mary Louise Menendez for cash. Their address was uh, 69 West Shore Drive, Pennington, New Jersey, 08534, and it is uh, it is signed by Mrs. Menendez. And that is something that's in our archives. Now, when the Menendez brothers were up for trial uh, the first time, and it was a hung jury, they were trying to raise money to uh, to pay for legal expenses to uh, for Eric Menendez. So actually, I wrote them a letter and I said, well, you know, I'll be happy to donate 50 bucks, but I want an autograph of Eric and Lyle Menendez. And I did get this funny reply from them. And it says, uh, it's from the Eric Menendez Legal Defense Fund, Wilshire Boulevard. Dear Scott, I am very sorry. Lyle and Eric are not for sale. Sincerely, the Eric Menendez Legal Defense Fund. And someone else sent me, which is kind of interesting. This is the form that the jury had to fill out when they were being uh, questioned about their availability and possible prejudices during the trial. It just says people of the state of California versus Eric Galen Menendez and, Jose and Joseph Lyle Menendez. It doesn't really say anything in particular, it just has the case number on it. It says if your hardship is based on your employment, please state where you are employed and the number of days for which you'll be paid for jury service. And if you have other reasons which you believe can constitute extreme personal hardship, please state them here. So that's very basic, but you can see from the top of it how it's uh, someone very nice sent this to me a few years ago. And it's just a, a curious uh, a piece of, um, I don't know, ephemera regarding the case. But we know for a fact that Jose and Kitty Menendez were murdered by their sons on that night, August 20th, uh, 1989. And we know for a fact that they uh, that they denied being involved for several months. But the fact is, they had shotguns, and they went into the house and shot their father, killed their father, didn't kill their mother yet. They went outside to reload their shotguns, went back in, and killed their mother. The mother was still alive. The mother watched the whole thing happen. Um, what happened exactly? So this is Jose Menendez's autopsy report. And he was wearing that night. I find these things kind of interesting. Oh, one other thing I wanted to talk about. There's been this, uh, I, I was in a documentary really recently and, and the people were picking apart what the press said about the about the case, how the press were saying there were berries and cream, they were eating berries and cream. And it became this like issue. I used to say it too. Um, the thing that's interesting is uh, they're saying that there was no food in the uh, in the area, but there was dishes and spoons in the kitchen, and there was um, what they say looked like berries in in Kitty's uh, in Kitty's stomach, which I'll read about in a little bit. So it's possible they had it when they had it. Maybe they weren't eating it at the time, but don't dismiss. I, I don't like when people were you know everyone said berries and cream and they're just full of crap. No, it's quite possible. Don't not full of crap actually. That's somewhat evidence based. Speculation still, but somewhat evidence-based. So Jose was, uh, he was wearing a sweatshirt, blood-soaked, with multiple holes or tears evident on the front. He was uh, wearing shorts, likewise blood-soaked. To the naked eye, no gunpowder residue was evident on the clothing. He was also wearing two shoes, leather, and two socks. Now, what they're saying is the anatomical summary. This is how it was summarized. Multiple shotgun wounds involving head, trunk, and extremities. Total number of five wounds. Multiple shotgun pellets recovered. 
Immediate fatal shotgun wound was of the head, a contact type. So that means the shotgun was put up to his head, like, like to his head. Shotgun wounds of extremities and trunk not considered immediately fatal. So uh, what they say, this is the investigator's report. Uh, the investigation. On August 21st, 1989, at 3.57 a.m., Sergeant Edmonds, Beverly Hills PD, notified the Forensic Science Center that both decedents, Mr. and Mrs. Menendez, had been found inside their residence. Both were victims of gunshot wounds. Uh, this detective responded to the address, 722 North Elm Drive in Beverly Hills, and confessed uh, and conferred sorry, with Detective Les Zoller. I was advised that both of the decedents were last seen by their sons at 10 p.m. the earlier day on the 20th of August. At the time, the sons left the residence to view a movie. At 2347, that'd be 1147 p.m., uh, the sons returned home and found the decedents, their parents. Police were summoned by a 911 from a telephone in the residence. Sergeant K. West responded and pronounced both of the decedents at 1150 p.m. on August 20th, 1989. Reportedly, the lights and the television were on in the den area where both of the decedents were found. Lights in the front entry area inside the residence were said to be on. It was unknown at the time if the front door was open upon return of the sons. Forced entry was not indicated to me. Detective Zollard stated that the residence did not appear to be ransacked. No suspects were known at the time, and the weapons used are not there. They're outstanding. Some of the residents in the area had been contacted uh, at the time at the, uh, of this report, and none of them reported hearing gunshots. At 4.50 a.m., I viewed the decedents. Mr. Menendez was seated at the end of the sofa in the den area. I observed shotgun wounds to the head, arm, and leg. Um, I observed Mrs. Menendez lying on her right side at the floor in front of the sofa. She had a shotgun wounds to her head and face area. The same type wounds were noted on her leg, hand, wrist, and shoulders. Uh, both of the decedents were transported to the Forensic Science Center, uh, and the autopsy was then uh performed and um i'm gonna go really brief on these okay because it's pretty technical and i'm not going to go into the directions of the wounds or any kind of business like that i'll just be very brief about it this is jose menendez's wounds a shot number one shotgun wound to the head multiple loose pellets and wadding recovered contact wound wadding from the shotgun it was bird shot so so it wasn't a bullet it like sprayed pellets and there were pellets everywhere uh the entrance wound is located at the back of the head um number two exit lacerations associated with this gunshot wound are located as follows on the right ear okay it's just saying it went through okay i said i wouldn't get into that but i did touch on that though the gunshot wound to the head is considered an immediately fatal gunshot wound. Number two, shotgun wound of the interior upper arm, right and forearm, uh, lead pellets were recovered. Shotgun wound number three of the right upper extremity, dorsal aspect, multiple load, uh, lead pellets were recovered. Number four, shotgun pellet wounds of the left elbow, multiple lead pellets recovered. Number five, shotgun of the left thigh, through and through wound, no projectile is recovered. Number six, individual shotgun pellet wound of the anterior chest may be related to one of the other shotgun wounds. Now, I wanted to go into the what was in his gastrointestinal uh, system, and it does not really say, it just says semi-solid food, so it doesn't really say anything about, uh, they couldn't recognize any particles uh, of food in his stomach. The final opinion of the uh, medical examiner, death is attributed to multiple shotgun wounds. A total number of five are identified. A shotgun pellet wound of the chest wall appears to be related to one of the shotgun wounds of the right upper extremity. I mean, the amount of damage that their shotgun, you know, it doesn't, it's not a solid bullet that goes straight forward. It sprays these pellets. They were all over the room. You can see the amount of damage. These are, these are poor copies. It's a, it's a rather old document, but I'll put some of these 
these up in a closer, you'll, you'll be able to see some of it a bit more closer. But you can see the amount of damage that was done to him. The first shot killed him, hit him in the back of the head. He was shot several more times. Here's the uh, another uh, graph. And it's not hard to find crime scene pictures. I'm not putting them in here because YouTube will shut me down. But you could find them. You'll find them online. And if you if you look and it's it's pretty it's pretty it's pretty gruesome so this is mary louise menendez this is her autopsy report at the time she was wearing a I, I, again these are facts i just enjoy because enjoy is a weird word but i like to know the last thing someone did when you put on your clothes this morning did you realize that was the last those are the last pieces of clothing you're ever going to put on I, find, I just find that kind of interesting so this is Kitty Menendez's autopsy report, and it's noted multiple gunshot wounds involving head, trunk, and extremities. Multiple pellets and wadding recovered. Fatal wounds. Uh, Mrs. Menendez was uh, was wearing a sweatshirt, blood soaked with multiple holes and tears evident in the front. There was also a blood soaked bra, and multiple holes evident in it. Um, this is the external ample, uh, well, actually what I'm gonna just do is go into the to the shotgun wounds. So, um, first shotgun wound to the head, bird shot pellets and wadding recovered, contact wound, straight up to her cheek. The second one, this is, that you know, they reloaded. They, went, they did all this and then they went outside and reloaded and then killed their mother with the shotgun wound to the cheek. That's, that's to me, just fascinating. Uh, number two shotgun wound at the head, entering the right cheek, orbit, nose, and portion of the left cheek. These consist of individual shotgun pellet wounds. Uh, the opinion, this is considered a fatal shotgun wound of the head. Number three, shotgun wound of the head involving right mandible and extension of medial right clavicles. Multiple load, lead pellets were recovered. This is considered a fatal shotgun wound number four shotgun wound of the head left ear and left posterior neck multiple bird shot pellets were recovered this is not considered an immediately fatal shotgun wound but could be contributed to the overall hemorrhage number five shotgun wound of the right arm multiple pellets recovered and the two entrance wounds are located in the upper right arm five inches below the top of the shoulder this may not have been an immediately fatal wound, but would be incapacitating because of the fracture of the humerus. Number six, shotgun wound to the chest, left side, multiple lead pellets recovered. This wound enters the left breast and approximately 16 individual pellet uh, wounds are identified. This is considered a fatal shotgun wound associated with perforation of the left lung and hemorrhage into the left pleural cavity. Number seven, shotgun wound to left hip thigh. Multiple pellets are recovered. This may not have been an immediately fatal wound, but it's considered incapacitating because of the complete fracture of the left femur. Number eight, shotgun wound of the left lower extremity. This is not considered an immediately fatal shotgun wound, but would be incapacitating because of the fracture of the left tibia. Number nine, shotgun wound of the left calf, graves or gutter wound. No bullets or projectile recovered, recovered from this one. This is a superficial graves or gutter wound, not considered fatal. Number 10, this is a shotgun wound of the right hand and is probably related by manipulation of the right upper extremity to shotgun wounds number two and three, so protected basically. It is not considered immediately fatal, uh, but would be incapacitating because of the fracture and avulsion of the thumb as described above. Now, this is the gastrointestinal system. Remember, I said the thing about the berries and cream that tends to get in people's craw. That's not true. It's not true. Well, it says right here, it contained, her stomach contained chewed semi-solid food, grape colored in or stained. So maybe it was berries, you know, who knows? But the, the fact that people use that as a, a reason to dismiss some people, I think is is is, is cheap and not factual because they couldn't possibly know. What we do possibly know is what happened to these people. This is what we absolutely do know, that these people were shotgunned to death by their sons who saw them 
claim they went to a movie, used weapons that they bought a couple of days earlier using one of their friend's IDs and pretended to have stumbled on the crimes. They left, got rid of the guns and changed their clothes and returned to the house and pretended to be grieving sons and made that 911 call. So the son's grie you know, grieving. Uh, now Lyle, later on, he says after they did it, um, he said, uh, he described the crimes and he said, well, after I killed my mother, which was really unfortunate for me, uh, they, they waited there. They sat there and waited for someone to call 911 and no police ever came. So they just figured in his own words, well, well maybe let's just leave and come up with an alibi or something like that. We were running in and it was, the room was dark, obviously, so I could, because the TV was on. And there were like shadows, and some shadow moved toward me. And I started blasting, and my brother started firing. We continued to fire, and it, it was still, there was still uh, movement. Somebody was scrambling around that coffee table. It was all I, I could barely see because the room was so smoky. And all I could feel was lots of shots going around the room and bouncing off, the pellets bouncing off from the shotgun. And uh, I didn't know what was going on. So I just ran out of the room and went and got another shell and ran back in the room and it was dark and smoky and fired again at the person that I had seen by the coffee table. I was just, I was in a crazed state. I came back in the room and I, I shot a final time. It turned out to be my mother, which is a great unfortunate thing to me, but uh, I didn't even think about it at the time. And I just dropped my guns and I went into the foyer and I waited. And I just slumped against the wall. I was exhausted from the event, and my brother was there, I guess, in the room, too. And I waited in the foyer for the police to come. And I figured, all right, well, I guess I'm going to jail. But, you know, the least I'm going to give it my best shot to explain what happened. And they never showed up. Never, nobody ever called. You know, whatever it is, 12 shots in the middle of Beverly Hills. Nobody called. And, uh, Everybody in the neighborhood heard it too, because they got about 10 people coming in saying they heard the shot. So nobody called, they just figured out Beverly Hills, it can't be. So we waited, and I must have waited there 10 minutes. And finally, my brother and I kind of like snapped to it, and we just said, let's, let's get the fuck out of here, and we can maybe come up with an alibi or something. Sure, so I'm not just going to call the police and tell myself it. And uh, so that's what I did. I, I left. So, uh, so they left. That's that, those are facts. Now, um, one thing I want to point out: Clark Fogg was a uh, forensic detective with the Beverly Hills Police Department, and Bar and Clark Fogg and Barbara Schroeder are people I know who wrote this book called Beverly Hills Confidential. And Clark Fogg told me that when he went to that crime scene at the Menendez house, he said it was the only crime scene that he, as a detective, had to enter with an umbrella because there was so much junk that hit the ceiling that was falling down and he says again this is perspective i'm not trying to be dramatic here he says um jose was shot six times slumped over body still in a macabre seated position on the couch in their family living room his wife kitty had fallen between the couch and the coffee table she'd been shot 10 times half of her face was torn off by bullets perhaps nothing drives home the gruesome nature of the attack more than this fact that never made the news. A group of investigators prepared to bag up Mr. Menendez's bullet riddled body, his brain detached from his skull and slid across the marble floor. Even the most hardened professionals, professionals had to leave the room. Now the police screwed up because they let the kids come in and grab some things and leave. Here's a fact that I found really interesting and so did they. Um, an odd question was one of the first clues that the sons may have been involved. 
while Clark Fogg was escorting Lyle to his father's office to get elimination fingerprints, because if there's a crime, they take everyone who's ever been in the house that they know of, take their fingerprints just so they can, if they come up, they can clear them. So taking these elimination uh, fingerprints, the oldest son nodded his head in the direction of the den where his parents' dead bodies lay. Is that the room that it happened in, he asked. As Fogg points out, Lyle knew the answer to the question because they were the ones that found the bodies and they're the ones that called 911. And he said it's a red flag when someone asks a question they already know the answer to. Uh, man, there's some other pretty, pretty, you know, Lyle, uh, I'm sorry, Eric wrote a movie script with a friend of his about a uh, about a r young rich kid who kills his parents for for the money. And ironically, Kitty Menendez, his own mother, helped him type that up. Um, now, there is evidence that they may possibly have been abused when they were younger. Up to 1976, someone claims that Lyle... Uh, told them of what their father was doing. And Lyle admitted to that, I guess, even back then, because he sort of repeated it with Eric. On a, and uh, so it, there is evidence that that they that could have happened. Um, would that have changed things with, the, with regards to the trial? I don't know. Certain evidence they weren't allowed in the trial, they weren't allowed to use. Um, one thing that was kind of in, very telling is after the murders, the two moved out of the house because they didn't want to live in the house anymore. So they bought side-by-side -side condos in Marina Del Rey. Uh, Lyle bought a Porsche. Uh, Eric hired an, a professional tennis coach. They bought a restaurant uh, in New Jersey. They bought Rolexes. So they were going through their parents' money. Lyle did the eulogy at his father's funeral, weeping, claiming the mafia did it. So it's not something they did in the heat of the moment. That I could kind of understand. If this is going to happen to them, I, I can kind of get that. But they claimed that their parents, they were going to come home and they, they, they were convinced that their parents were going to kill them. As they were sitting in front of the television, uh, Kitty was filling out Eric's college application. They felt threatened by, you know, they felt their lives being threatened threatened uh, uh, at that very moment that they had to do it after they, you know, they saw them and claimed they went to the movies, which they didn't do, and then went in the room with shotguns and then ran out of ammunition and went back out and reloaded. And then they pretended to be grieving sons for the longest time, going through their parents' money. They wouldn't let that evidence be shown in the trial because the family was saying, um, I don't know who in the family. I think it was the, the defense was actually saying, oh, they're rich kids in Beverly Hills. That's just what they do with money. So they wouldn't allow that to be uh, to be submitted into evidence. Another thing that was really kind of gross is that Eric confessed to a psychiatrist, Dr. Ozeal, that, he, that they did it. And apparently, Lyle, Eric told Lyle, and Lyle went to the analyst or the psychiatrist and, and threatened him. So the, the psychiatrist, though he was bound by this attorney, attorney uh, I'm sorry, uh, doctor client privilege, uh, he was scared for himself. So he had his mistress sit outside and listen in, or, or tapes. He had tapes and told her about the tapes. So they broke up and she went to the police and, and that's sort of what, what <laughs> I mean, it's just a mess, just a total mess. Uh, were the kids victims of abuse? I don't know. It's possible. I wasn't there. There's a documentary that came out about uh, one of the kids from Menudo, uh, the group Menudo, who claims Ho Jose Menendez did uh, abuse him. So I, I don't think it's uh, out of... I don't think it's out of reason to think that may have happened. It's interesting to note, though, that, you know, we say that they were going to kill, you know, parents who thought the parents were going to kill him, but they never really say much about Kitty. Uh, somebody said that uh, earlier on, I don't know what, the 70s or whatever it was, somebody told her that the father was doing bad things, and she told him to shut up, and it just was hush-hushed about that. But, and she was a, you know, she was a drinker, apparently. She was an alcoholic. And she, um, you know, that's her crime, I guess, was shutting up and not saying anything, which which is a crime. But I don't think that 
I don't think that they, the, the sons were in immediate danger. If that were to have happened, if it was going to happen right that minute, I can understand their anger in doing something like that. But they prepared. They got the gun. They, you know, they established an alibi and they, you know, they were weeping and, and grieving and spending their parents' fortune under, it's a, a, close to a million dollars that they pissed through uh, until they were finally busted because of this mistress of this psychiatrist. What a mess. The whole thing's a mess. And I don't know if there's any people in this case that, are, that aren't that are despicable. Um, do they deserve a new trial? I don't know, because what they did is not up for speculation. They admit to what they did. The reason behind they did it, my, I always said this, that if someone is swinging a baseball bat at my head, I don't give a shit what's going on in their mind and their motivations behind it. All I know is that's happening. So it's like, it's like I'll keep going back to Helter Skelter. I don't care why it happened. What I care is that it happened. And those two people, Jose and Kitty Menendez, are dead. And these kids did piss through the fortune and pretend to be grieving sons. And they did it. They did it. So murder, manslaughter, whatever. I don't know. I, I, and I really don't care. I don't like them. I've never made that uh, a secret. And if there was any kind of unfairness, I don't know. It's hard to say. Some people say, well, people that did a lot worse, you know, spent less time in prison. Well, that doesn't matter because cases are, 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 um, decided on an individual basis. And you can't say, well, this guy got murdered and he only got this amount of time. It doesn't work that way. This is an indiv individual case. They had to use three juries, two trials, three juries to finally convict these two. And they're in prison for the rest of their lives and unless they can prove something you know, went really wrong and with the trial and they can get a retrial, but it doesn't change the facts that they did what they did. And it was premeditated, absolutely premeditated. I don't think that's up for speculation either. It, 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 people get really worked up, and I do too. Um, but, you know, here's something that's interesting, a wild, interesting fact. The Menendez, uh, he worked for RCA, RCA Records, and the Arithmics had been in that house. Elton John used to live in that house. This is just this is just gossip. Elton John lived in that house, and they found they found gay uh, magazines in, in Eric's room, and he claimed that Elton John left them behind. <laughs> <laughs> which I think is kind of funny. And Nicole Brown Simpson's baby shower was held in that house. So I, just some, some odd facts about that house. It just sold really recently for $17 million. I guess they were acting, asking, uh, asking 20. And one time I was going by the house on the tour and Oh, one time I was going by the house, it was Halloween, and they had a Grim Reaper, like one of those inflatable Grim Reapers around the front door, which is fascinating to me because I don't know. <laughs> I'm sure they didn't process the whole thought, but yeah, the Grim Reaper at the Menendez front door. But one time I was there, and this kid in an upper window came out with a semi automatic weapon. He did not point it at me, but what he did was he had it in his arm like this, and he went like that. And he's showing it to me, making it quite clear what I was, you know, what he was showing me. And I'm like, this is messed up. So, uh, you know, we, the next stop was the Beverly Hills Park where we stopped for the restroom and there were police officers there. And I said, this is what just happened. Somebody pulled a semi-automatic web and I, at the Menendez house, he says, oh, crazy stuff happens at the house all the time. And it was really dismissive and actually smiled. So, um, you know, I don't know. There's a whole lot of gross stuff involved in, in this case. And there's no, there's there's no people that I respect in this case at all, maybe the prosecution, but that's because I'm biased. But these two little kids, spoiled kids, they're, they're, they're adults now in prison, both married now, although they're now in the same prison, which is, which is uh, you know, that, they were supposed to be separated, now they're together. Um, and apparently that's more humane after you kill your parents, that, that your co-conspirator, which is what he was, can be in the same prison as you, yippee. Um, anyway, no winners here. And that's just, the last part of this is, is just my opinion, but I feel pretty strongly about it. And a lot of people feel pretty strongly about it in the other direction. So be it. We're all adults. We can have this conversation. But I'll tell you, it gets me all riled up and I know it gets others riled up. So who knows what's going to happen. But anyway, rest in peace, Jose and Kitty Menendez. You heard me.